Thank you for coming to the FCC this lovely autumn day before a public holiday. My name is Tara Joseph. I'm on the Board of Governors here and a senior journalist at Reuters. What a treat to talk about U.S. foreign policy in a club that focuses so much on China. And what a treat as well to discuss Russia and its role in foreign policy in the upcoming U.S. elections in the United States. I think we can all, even this far away from the U.S., feel a whiff of Cold War politics going on, especially with what is happening in Syria these days. It's my pleasure to introduce Jamie Rubin, who I think has had one of the most interesting careers I've ever heard of, a senior official under the Clinton administration, working for Madeleine Albright, an academic, and also has worked uh, in TV and print media um, across the board. Also, I think Hong Kong is a very special place for you. You were here in 1997, standing in between Maggie Thatcher and Madeleine Albright. That had to be a very special moment. And I think as well, you told me you got on a plane to come to Hong Kong. Al Gore, it looked like, had won the election. And by the time you arrived in Hong Kong, Bush was declared victor. So Hong Kong must have a very special place. So we're delighted to hear your views today on US foreign policy and also whether you think Hillary Clinton will win the next election. Jamie Rubin. Thank you all very much, and thank you very much for that introduction. It does, um, remembering those two events that you described, uh, and really with, with Maggie Thatcher and Madeleine Albright, we were on the porch, and if you remember, for those of you who were here, it was raining, and so everyone was in their umbrellas, so they're, we were packed in, and I, I remember that you could barely see the fireworks, but Madeleine Albright was this close to this cheek, and Maggie Thatcher was this close to this cheek. And that's an image I've had a lot of trouble getting, uh, <laughs> coming to grips with. And, and that's about all I have to say about that. Um, when I used to stand at a podium, really exactly like this, same height, my hands like this, I was the spokesman for the State Department for several years at a time when the United States was very comfortable in its role as, as we like to call itself, the in, ourselves, the indispensable nation. We were comfortable with our leading role. We didn't do everything right, um, although I never would have admitted that then. Um, but uh, we were comfortable in, in exerting uh, the power of the United States. Uh, and it hasn't been true for a long time since that we've been able to marry the power and the principle and the uh, greatness of America um, in, in combinations. Uh, in many ways, George Bush brought us one swing of the pendulum to reaching 10,000 miles across the world and overthrowing a government, and it went really, really badly, and we're still paying the terrible price for it. But the pendulum has now swung the other way, and probably too far in the direction of, of minding our own business, believe it or not. And President Obama has spoken just the other day about how his policies, he was being questioned, were may not have been good for the world, but they were good for America. And I'm not saying that President Obama is an isolationist, because he's not. But that mentality is one that is new and unique over the last several years, to have uh, such a focus on what is called nation building at home rather than uh, foreign policy abroad. So the pendulum swings under eight years of Bush and then eight years of Obama have brought us to a point where, you know, I think I have it with me. I'm sure you've all seen this, but, you know, you have the cover of The Economist with George Bush, Vladimir, sorry, Barack Obama, Vladimir Putin, and President Xi playing poker. And they're all playing, and they're all at the same table. And at least in Syria right now, the United States is not holding all the high cards. Just think about the fact that a story was going around the other day 
that uh, the Iraqi uh, government, the leading uh, members of the Shiite party of the Iraqi government, were talking about asking the United States to step back or step out and the Russians to step in. So the country that expended tens of thousands of wounded and killed Americans, a trillion dollars, ruined our reputation worldwide both for the decision to go in and the incompetence with which we uh, have acted since then, brought these people to power and got rid of Saddam Hussein, and they want to substitute the Russians for the United States. Now, I don't think that's going to happen, but I think it's under serious consideration, and just that alone is pretty depressing. Um, but let me get directly to the topic just for about 10, 15 minutes, and then take your questions to the, I gather we have at least some in the journalistic community, and I was saying at the beginning when I stood at this podium, I had this group of people, mostly journalists, in front of me at the spokesman, and their job was to ask the questions, and my job was to avoid answering them. <laughs> um, but today, I don't have to avoid answering them. I can answer them. I'm speaking for myself. That's one of the good parts of being an academic or a journalist. You can actually, well, I'm a columnist, luckily enough, so I can express my opinions. Um, Foreign policy and U.S. elections is a very uh, complex topic. There actually hasn't been a lot of scholarship about it, uh, but I feel like I've lived it for the last 25-plus uh, years of my professional life. My first job was as an arms control analyst for a think tank during the height of the Cold War. So for most of the Cold War, uh, it was pretty easy to understand the politics of foreign policy. The Republicans were the hawks. The Democrats were either doves or they liked to call themselves owls because they were wise. Uh, and the debates fell into pretty uh, standard categories. Uh, the successful Democrats were those who were avoided a label of being too de dovish. And the successful um, uh, Republicans, uh, you know, in many ways were what is gone now, the internationalist wing of the Republican Party of the George Bush Sr., the father, Richard Lugar, and others like that. Um, but we knew what side you were on pretty much during the Cold War. Um, and so when the election rolled around, everything was pretty simple. For those of you old enough, you may remember a de Democratic candidate named Michael Dukakis who was caught wearing a, tank, uh, a, a helmet and riding around in a tank, and that helped him lose the 1988 election to... George Bush Sr. When the Cold War ended, when communism fell, it got very confusing. And in fact, Bill Clinton won in 1992 largely because foreign policy wasn't part of the election. And he coined that famous phrase, it's the economy stupid. And because if foreign policy had been part of that election, George Bush would have won handily. Let's remember, George Bush, the father, won the Gulf War exactly the way he said he would. He gathered together a coalition with hundreds of thousands of Syrian and Saudi and Arab troops, had a UN resolution. The Japanese paid for everything. <laughs> and, and the US suffered very few casualties, and the enemy was a clear-cut monster with nuclear weapons. He really had them back then, or nearly had them. So George Bush Sr. was a you know, it was Barack Obama said he modeled his foreign policy after George Bush Sr.'s uh, foreign policy. But Clinton won the election because it was gone from the concerns of the electorate in 92. Um, in 96, I worked for President Clinton's reelection campaign. My job was director of foreign policy. And I wasn't very busy. Um, and I remember Hillary Clinton and I had a... Um, had a bet. I think Sandy Berger, Hillary Clinton, and I had a bet. It's the second debate. It's in San Diego. We're at the some you know site in San Diego, and we bet as to the number of questions in the debate that would relate to foreign policy. The winning number was three out of like 45, 
And that was only if you counted the third as a question about the naval base near San Diego. That was foreign policy. Otherwise, it was two. Um, and then 2000, remember, think about this. In, 19, in 2000, George W. Bush now, the son, was the moderate, wasn't interested in foreign policy, said we should be a humble nation, and the likes of me and Bill Clinton's administration were too mouthy, too talkative, too uppity about you know, America's leadership role, and that we, we should, his phrase was, we should be humbler. We should have a humble foreign policy. That was his critique of the Democrats of, of Clinton and Gore by extension. And during one of the debates, the one or two times foreign policy came up, he criticized Al Gore for being too into nation building. I forget where it was, maybe it was Rwanda or some Somalia or something. He was saying that you Democrats are you know, making a mistake by doing nation building. So think about this. So, Bush wins or doesn't win, depending on which end of the flight I was on. Um, but he won, he became president, and he initiated the two largest nation-building operations in the history of the United States or the world since World War II. And arguably, we've spent more money in Iraq and Afghanistan, certainly American money, than we spent in Germany and Japan. That's how big these projects are. Now, I wish we had done them as well as we did back in the World War II, because then Iraq uh, would have uh, turned out a lot better and wouldn't be asking for the Russians to replace the United States. And in Afghanistan, as you may know or following, the President Obama was hoping to announce that, you know, all the wars had ended on his watch, and every American was brought home by the end of 2016, and he had ended wars. That was his mission, he said. And we could concentrate, and think about the meaning of this, for those of you, especially Americans, living in Hong Kong, so we could focus on nation building at home. But the world got in the way, as the British, uh, I guess it was a prime minister said, events got in the way, and he's reversed himself, and now he's agreed that in Afghanistan, American forces will stay at least another year, and he'll leave that decision to the next president. So those are you know, some background for you to think about uh, uh, during uh, this coming election. It's about a year from now, and foreign policy, I think, will play a role. Um, after 9-11 in America, foreign policy matters a lot more. When those policemen and firemen ran up the steps to help save those innocent civilians in the World Trade Center, they gave their lives. And I think Americans felt that. And so the whole idea that soldiers and people who care about our country should give their lives, that, that changed after 9-11. Before 9-11, I mean, I remember when one pilot was missing from uh, the Bosnia mission, I think his name was Scott O'Grady, and the country came to a standstill in 1990, I guess it was eight, uh, no, it was earlier, it was probably 1995, when one pilot was missing for a couple of days, the whole country was, you know, riveted. Would this one pilot be found? Eventually he was found, he ended up smoking a cigar with, or being with Bill Clinton on the Truman balcony, smoking a cigar with Anthony Lake, the national security advisor. But after 9-11, our notion of, of, of sacrifice changed. And so that's how we've been at these two lengthy wars uh, ever since. So foreign policy will play a role, but there will be something new. And, and we should expect some of the knee-jerk Cold War formulations to come back. And the reason is, is partly the picture on the cover of The Economist, and partly the failings of the administration's leadership in the world. I'm sorry to use cartoons, but I gather we're honoring a cartoonist in one of the books. I, I was struck a couple of weeks ago 
by this cartoon in which it showed uh, the UN podium at the General Assembly and there was the leading spot and it said leader of the world under the seat and Putin sat himself in the seat and Obama was over there and he said, I thought it was vacant. Um, and President Obama, for good or ill, and part, clearly partly by design, has not wanted America to bear the burden and, of leadership of, of the world. Um, and again, leadership doesn't mean you do everything. It just means that you're leading, you're gathering together a coalition. Um, I think that's when the world works best. When the United States is gathering friendly, allied nations together to do something. If we do it alone, we saw what happened in Iraq. Um, if nobody does it without, with leaders, or let me give you a better example. Libya, we did leading from behind, we said. And look what happened. Gaddafi was gone, but there was no leadership after that, and it turned into a mess, and we're gonna be paying for that for dozens of years. In order to do the complicated business of, of foreign policy in a complicated world, somebody has to be in charge who's got the wherewithal militarily, politically, financially, economically. The European Union isn't capable of that. They're barely capable of, of agreeing on how to deal with the incoming refugees, and that's gonna you know, be a long time to come. There's no other country who's willing. China, which we can get to, uh, is just beginning to see itself as having any role outside of the region with its very modest contribution to peacekeeping. Um, I'm going to just end by suggesting to you that where you're likely to see um, an unusual focus is on Russia and Vladimir Putin. And because the decision of Russia to enter into Syria in such a big way, coming on the heels of its invasion of Ukraine, its absorption of the Crimea, you know, is pretty much the worst thing that's happened in American foreign policy in a long, long time. You have a government that has thrown away 40, 50 years of rules of the international community in Europe, invaded Ukraine, absorbed Crimea. Whether you think it should have been Russians all along, one thing the world thought it agreed on was that you don't invade smaller countries and absorb them into larger countries. Um, and Putin did that with really rather modest consequences. And the key was he thought he could do what he's doing in Syria with no consequences. He thought he could mislead the United States, mislead the British, mislead the Europeans, tell the world he was fighting ISIS. Everyone forgot if he wanted to fight ISIS, there's been a coalition fighting ISIS for the last year. He didn't seem very interested in that over the last year. He obviously wasn't interested in fighting ISIS. So he misled the leaders at the United Nations and entered a war in Syria for the first time Russia's entered a war. And look who it's entered a war with, Iran, Hezbollah, and Bashar Assad. And if the Syrian war wasn't so messy, we would be able to focus on the fact that Bashar Assad and his intelligence services have been engaged in a massive campaign of mass murder, documented with pictures. The photographer of the, of the dead bodies defected, and he had a computer disk, and he said, he worked for one intelligence service which wanted to be sure that it got the credit for the killings over another intelligence service. And he came out with pictures of tens of thousands of murdered prisoners. You know, I don't need to remind anyone in this part of the world. We have Cambodia in the part of the world where I live now, London. We have Bosnia. We have the Holocaust. That's pretty much the worst kind of behavior human governments can engage in. That's the... Syrian regime that Russia is allied with. Hezbollah, I hope, speaks for itself. The Iranian government may have made a deal with nuclear, uh, on its nuclear program, but I think we can all agree has not been uh, uh, the leading civilized country in the world when it came to 
the hostage crisis or any number of other activities. So this is R Vladimir Putin, just a few years since we thought Russia might join NATO, is now fighting an actual war, a hot war. Not, you know, supporting, providing some weapons, financing. They are fighting a hot war in the heart of Europe with their aircraft, their artillery, potentially more than that on the ground, with Hezbollah and Iran and the Syrian armed forces. I think that's going to get a lot of attention. I think the language you're going to see is from Republicans. And what they'll start with, and I'll end with this, <laughs> people laughed at him. President Obama mocked. I'm a Democrat, so I'm just telling you what, I, what the facts are. This is not said happily. Mocked Mitt Romney during a debate in, two, in 2012. He mocked him. He said, are you saying we're going to go back? I think he said something like to, to the days of the catapults and the bows and arrows, because Mitt Romney said that Russia was the biggest strategic challenge we faced. Everyone's forgotten about that. Romney gave this quote somewhere along the campaign trail that he was asked, what's the biggest problem you would face as president? And he said Russia, and he had his reasons. And I'll agree, it was probably a little overstated. But President Obama and his advisors thought it would be real clever to mock Romney for that, to accuse him of living in the past and being, you know, discussing slingshots and bows and arrows and catapults. I can assure you we're going to hear that quote again when the campaign comes around. Because the truth is, and I know you talk about China a lot, and I'm happy to talk about that. I just came from Burma, where they've been thinking about China a lot. Um, Russia is now a major, major problem for the stability of the world. Its leadership uh, is, is very confident. Uh, and is causing a lot of problems. And I suspect, unfortunately, Russian, Russia will be a dominant theme uh, in the coming election. With that, let me stop and take your questions. Thank you very much. If you just want to raise your hands, we'll bring microphones around to you, starting right here. And then I'm going to let you choose your own questions. Okay. You're pretty good at that. I don't, I don't think I'm needed here. Hi, uh, Nigel Sharman. And without trying to channel Bill O'Reilly too much, I mean, I think there is this sense that America and uh, Obama are being pushed around presently. Where do you think Hillary stands on this? Because um, presently it's difficult to uh, know exactly what she stands for. And what sort of America does she want to lead should she win? I think if anyone has looked at my resume, they would know that I, I was, uh, I am friendly and, and supportive of Hillary Clinton. In 2008, I was a formal, you know, sub, uh, it was called a surrogate in, in, on CNN and debates. So I did speak for the candidate then. I'm not going to do that today. Um, and so anyone who was hoping that I would, I'm sorry, but that's not why I'm here. That's not my current job. Um, and I'll be happy to tell you what I think uh, and give you a few facts that might give you some uh, either happiness or unhappiness about Mrs. Clinton. In her memoirs, if you pick it up, the I think it's Hard Choices, the last book, she talks about how she wrote a memo to President Obama in the closing months of her uh, time as Secretary of State advocating a change in course on Russia. And she said she had concluded that uh, we are no longer in a position uh, to get much uh, business done with Vladimir Putin and uh, that they are heading in the wrong direction and that we need to uh, respond accordingly, that we should not be pursuing business as usual with Russia any longer. This is well before Ukraine and well before um, any of that happened. When uh, Ukraine invaded, when Russia invaded Ukraine and took Crimea, you know, she was quoted in, in a news story making the factual analogy to what happened in World War II with another uh, country, large country, taking over a small country in Europe. And that became quite controversial. I say that because I think that while the reset 
that President Obama's administration engaged in after George Bush's administration was smart enough at the time. We had some business to do. And we have to do business with people we don't like and don't trust and, and, and are worried about and nervous about and, and fear even all the time. Um, and I, I frankly think the change in Russia came about during the Bush administration. Because if you remember, in the early years of President George W. Bush, Vladimir Putin was happy to go along with American foreign policy. He was the first leader to call President Bush after the 9-11 attacks, offered bases in, in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, unheard of things, supported the mission in Afghanistan, this is even after Bush had ripped up the ABM treaty and started building a missile defense. Um, Putin was with the, the, the United States, comfortable with its leadership role. And the change happened, in my opinion, if you, history, historians look at this, the change happened over the Iraq war, that Putin felt that he had a right to be consulted and participate in the decision to invade Iraq over weapons of mass destruction, which was a matter before the UN Security Council. Now, I'm not going to debate that, with, but if, if historians look, they'll see that. So the Obama people came in and said, OK, the Russians are not the Russians of the Yeltsin era. We've got some issues, but we've got some business we've got to do. We'd like to get a nuclear arms treaty down reducing uh, nuclear weapons from, I think, don't hold me to this, but something like three, 4,000 to two, 3,000. We've got a lot of equipment we've got to deploy in Afghanistan. If we go through Pakistan, they make us pay by the ton. Pakistan made the U.S. military pay by the ton for anything that went into Afghanistan. And through the northern route, it was called through Russia, uh, it wasn't charged. So we had business to be done. We did it. But then at some point, I think after a set of activities, Mrs. Clinton at least, uh, drew a conclusion. So that's one fact. The second fact is that she put forward before the president a rather modest proposal in the early days of the Syrian civil war saying, you know, these people are clearly the majority would like to see Assad go, but the minority have the weapons because they're the army by and large or have control of the army. Uh, and General Petraeus, who you may remember, was one of the few successful generals in the Iran and Af Iraq and Afghanistan uh, wars. Uh, and she came up with a plan to try to give the Syrian opposition well before there was an ISIS or there was a, a you know extremist Islamic militias in Syria to try to uh, deal with the civil war at that time. I happen to think that the failure to deal with Syria early on, the decision to remove all of our troops from Iraq, forget whether you were for or against the war. I was pretty conflicted myself. But once you've invested all that and, and the people's lives and the soldiers and the trillion dollars, why would you throw it away so you could say you ended American involvement in before your re-election campaign, which is exactly what the White House did. They wanted to be able to say in 2013 that all our troops were gone from Iraq, so they pulled out. Um, so that plus Syria is a vacuum. That vacuum has been filled in the most dangerous organization of my lifetime, ISIS, far more than Al-Qaeda, if they choose to focus on the civilized world as opposed to just fighting for their borders, which is what they're doing now. Imagine those people with all those, with passports to Europe and the United States. Passports, they can't be prevented from coming back unless we change all our laws. And they believe in this whacked out system of slavery and murder and burning people alive. And there's tens of thousands of them. And they have a little country and nobody's really done very much about it, including Vladimir Putin, who is busy bombing the reasonable opposition. I'm, I haven't answered your question directly, but I've tried to do what I thought was appropriate in answering it. Yes. Many years ago, I got lost in Damascus. Um, it was very stable, it was safe. And um, I was in a dodgy area of Damascus where there were a lot of refugees from Iraq. 
Iran. From Iraq. Iraq. There were in, at that time, there were millions of refugees from Iraq in Syria. And um, one of the people who showed us around, showed us, see here, me, I fought in Chechnya. Right? So I know from personal experience that there is a link to Chechnya. So I think the Russians do have some kind of interest. Um, and I have to say, from the European perspective, we need to fix it because we have a problem arriving by sea. Um, now, my question to you is, in this moment, how do you see a solution to Syria? Right. Um, I don't think anybody doubts the Russians have a major problem with Islam. Big, big, big problem. Not just Chechnya, but a whole number of countries. I suspect they didn't help that problem by invading and flattening Chechnya and murdering anyone who... Uh, who challenged them, and I suspect they've got a bigger problem now that they've joined forces with Assad, who's now the biggest murderer of Sunni Muslims in the world, and uh, the leader of Shiite Islam, Ir the, uh, the Iran. They, the Russians are now the enemy of Sunni, the Sunni world. Now, that may be good for them or maybe bad. I suspect it's bad, but that's not the issue from America's perspective. From America's perspective, it's should the Russian president have a relationship with our president in which he says he's going to fight ISIS and he wants to create a coalition to fight ISIS and says he's going to do that and then you turn around and he's started bombing uh, rebels who we were supporting who have nothing to do with ISIS. That's called power politics. That's the poker game. Not about whether he has a legitimate interest in Islam, which he clearly does. Um, and you've, you've actually made a really interesting point. Back when Syria was uh, less uh, of the enemy of the modern world, Bashar Assad was working to create ISIS, was helping the, uh, the regime uh, elements in Iraq to create people to go in and fight the Americans. And we used to go to these, when the U.S. government used to go to Damascus and say, shut the pipeline between Damascus and Iraq so these people don't go in and kill American soldiers. The them was ISIS, the, meaning the extremists from this particular group of people who morphed into ISIS. ISIS is what Assad wanted. He is happy to have ISIS. He wants a choice between him, the moderate, secular, Western, you correct, uh, safe, Damascus, Syria, Assad, and ISIS. And then he thinks the whole world will choose Assad, and Russia being the first of the bunch. If only it were that simple. <laughs> if only we could just make nice with Bashar Assad and forget his mass murdering, and everything would be great. Remember, once these wars start, we don't get to decide who fights. We didn't start the war in Syria, and I doubt it's going to end until the people who are fighting, whose brothers and sisters and uncles and aunts died or were murdered, uh, decide that it's time. We have very little influence over the people on the ground because we haven't done very much. And so the United States, other powers can, you know, exhort. We can say, we really think this is a fair deal. But what's a fair deal for those people, the majority of the country, who either left and want to go back, who are sitting in refugee camps in Turkey, in Jordan, in Lebanon, or as you say rightly, have started, it's a cascade, it's really simple. Just think about this. The UN stopped paying for the refugee camps in Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey. So all the people from the Syrian war that were there could no longer get beds and food and support. So they looked over and I'm not going back to Syria because it just keeps getting worse and worse. Every year we thought the war couldn't get worse, it's gotten worse. So they came to Europe on these boats, and then Europe, oh my God. Well, um, until that war stops, or until refugee camps are created in the region where people are willing to stay, Europe will have a refugee problem. I don't have a magic solution to the Syrian civil war, but I can assure you that Vladimir Putin and Barack Obama will not be able to stop the war, even if they wanted to, which I don't think uh, Putin does. Yes. Please, number one and number two, okay? <laughs> um, 
Thanks. I'm going to turn you back to U.S. politics a little bit, but if you don't mind, uh, Mark Michelson from, from IMA Asia. One, one commentator has described the possible, whoever is, a, whoever is chosen as a presidential candidate this time, as likely to be populist, nativist, and protectionist. That was Fareed Zakari as, as well as many others. First of all, do you agree with that? And, you know, maybe even a Democrat if it's Bernie Sanders. Do you agree with that characterization or something like that? And if so, what are the implications for U.S. foreign policy going forward? Never mind what we've seen in the past, which I largely, I largely unfortunately agree with what you've, you've said about the current administration. Right. By the way, I'm a Democrat, and I, would, I voted for Obama, and I think he was a lot better than Mitt Romney or John McCain, okay? I just wanted... I, one of the advantages of not being a spokesman for the government is you can actually say what's going on without being uh, accused of being, uh, you know, bad at your job. Um, look, uh, I don't know whether Fareed wrote it right that way. For, I think that's nonsense. Um, the next president, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, is going to be one of three or four people. They are not going to be nativist. They are not going to be whatever the other two, the adjectives were. Can you remind me? Protectionist and populist. Protectionist po or populist in the classic definition of the word. That sounds like one of Fareed's stupider comments. Um, uh, they are going to be responding to the pendulum. I believe the pendulum swung too far under Bush this way. I believe it hit its... I think the word, is it apogee over here? <laughs> I've always wondered about that one. Yes? Apogee, I think so. The height, yeah, the height. And so it's going to come back to the middle. We're going to be willing to be engaged uh, in the world. We're going to recognize that inaction has a big price. The Europeans are paying a huge price for their unwillingness to do anything about Syria for four years. Simple calculus. We didn't tell the war to start. No matter, the, the opposition grew because they were tired of living under Assad and they saw change in the rest of the Arab world. Whether you think it was safe and happy or you think it was uh, you know, horrible, they decided that. And they started fighting. And they actually didn't even fight. What they did was just have a little demonstration. And then this crazy regime they went and found the children of the demonstrators and brought them into the police station and mutilated them and then delivered the bodies to the demonstrators. Okay, that's how the war started. And then it, you can imagine that might create, uh, in a period of Tunisia and Egypt, um, further demonstrations, further outrage, and eventually violence. Um, yes, President Obama said that uh, Assad has lost legitimacy. I've seen people say that somehow, therefore, everything that happened since is his fault. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. You know, the United States is neither capable of solving every problem uh, nor to blame for every problem in the world. There's a place in the middle where we could decide to act if we believe it's in our interest, and if we exert our power and believe it's worth doing, we can influence events. But we were never able to solve all the world's problems ourselves, or even with great coalitions, especially when a people decide to fight their leader who've been oppressed for a long period of time. Um, so I hope the next president is conscious of the cost of inaction, as well as the cost of action. Look, in a way what happens, what I worry about is that the Republicans will have learned nothing from the Iraq war and want to you know, do it again in some other country. And the Democrats, who I don't agree with, learned, overlearned the lesson of the Iraq war. There is a happy medium. There is a place where legitimately the interests of the world are benefit from an American leadership role. I, I happen to be involved in one. I still think holds up after all this time, and that's Kosovo, small place, I grant you. But there was a classic case of a 
genocidal leader trying to kill a bunch of people and the same kind of ethnic battles. It's always pretty much the same. Everyone thinks they're supposed to get everything. And we intervened. We had the world support. We had a plan for what to do if we won in the form of a peacekeeping force. You can't just let these things solve themselves. And this was crucial. We had the rebels agree in advance that if we helped them, they'd put down their arms after the, they won. And then we provided aid and money and military police. And now these people that everyone thought were these crazy Albanian Muslim weirdos are now prime ministers and presidents. And if you go there, it looks pretty much like the rest of southeastern Europe. So it's doable. Kosovo was small. Afghanistan was big and far, far more uh, undeveloped. And Iraq had suffered through sanctions. But I think we didn't do it very well. Even if you were against going in, I think everyone would have wanted Iraq to at least succeed so that the people there could live a relatively normal life and the war would not continue on end. You know, I mean, this war is still going on and it's 10 years ago. War, I'm getting my dates wrong. It's 13 years ago, 12 and a half years ago. That's Iraq. So um, there is a happy medium. I don't agree with that column. We're just about to oh go God, to 2 o'clock. Oh, God, I give such long answers. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mike, one last okay. quick question. Sure. Uh, Mike Rouse, thank you so much for the answers, which, if I may say so, have been even more exciting than the original introduction. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you one more question. Uh, when the Republican circus began, there were 17 clowns. Um, we're now down to, I think, 15. Would you... Would you as the numbers get winnowed down, as the debates go on, would you like to speculate about who will be the last three or four yeah. standing and who will be the winner, ultimately? Well, I, I, I don't know, obviously. And you asked me, would I, would I speculate a little bit? And I will, because why not? I have nothing to lose by, guess, speculating on the Republicans. Um, Donald Trump will not be in the last three, okay? He's a lot of fun now. These reporters have, it's a year before the election, okay? A year. And it's months before the first voting of primaries. And they've been covering it for a year already. It's exciting to have a guy say all this literally crazy stuff. But if you peel it away, it's worse than crazy. You know, it's the part of American you know, politics that, that makes me ashamed sometimes. It's this sort of, you know, uh, see, you know, it's the kind of thing people say in bar stools as solutions. Let's build a wall. <laughs> I mean, you, you live in a place that's very near China. You know how ridiculous it is to suggest we could build a wall. Um, we're not going to build a wall and solve the problem with Mexico and immigration from southern uh, South America. So people like that will go away once real voting starts. People, you know, find it interesting. And there is a wing of the Republican Party that is kind of angry at the fact that Democratic president is in charge and the Republicans can't stop him. And the last Republican president they had made things worse. I mean, think about it. Imagine if you're a Republican and you know the last time you had the White House for eight years, you lost wars and you cost us trillions of dollars, and you left with a financial crisis, the worst since the Depression. You know, you could see why they'd be pretty mad. Um, so it's not a happy place. But unfortunately, most of their, their foreign policy professionals, Jeb Bush, uh, Rubio, John Kasich, the, the people that I would sit down and have great respect for personally and talk to and hopefully come to some agreement with. The people advising them are from the George W. Bush administration largely, who believe that we won the Iraq war. Oh, I mean, there's people who believe that. Saddam Hussein is gone and everything since is not really our fault and you know that's what happens and I guess the phrase was stuff happens. and. Um, so there's going to be some serious arguments about these sorts of things because 
Uh, there is still a very different view about how much damage Iraq did to the United States' reputation, to the, to the region, to stability in the region, and, and to the soldiers who had to fight the battle. Imagine, you know, you were just whipsawed from one side to the other. We're winning, we're losing. It matters, it doesn't matter. We're pulling out, we're going back in. And you lost a leg in that war. Imagine how mad you are. Um, so it's still very, very intense, the Iraq war, and there's a real difference in view, a view among those, I think, largely Democrats who believe that the costs have clearly outweighed the benefits, and those who still believe that, as Jeb Bush, who's a very reasonable, intelligent guy, said, if he had to do it over again, he probably would do it over again. That, there's a big gulf between those. So the last three standing would be? I named some names. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Rubin, thank you very much for joining us today. We do have a small gift from the club to say thank you and wish everyone a wonderful afternoon.